I'm Arpin Akashian, and I am a diocesan ministry staff member at the Eastern Diocese of the Armenian Church of America. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to invite my colleague, Jennifer Morris, to go over our Zoom guidelines. Jenny? All right. Well, welcome. Thank you. Many of you have been living on Zoom these last few months and are quite familiar with it. We ask that throughout tonight's call, if you'll remain on mute, uh, that way we can hear our speaker. And to help you stay focused on the speaker, we encourage you to go into speaker view rather than gallery view. That way you can hear uh, the thoughts and words presented this evening. We will be recording as well as taking screenshots. So if you're uncomfortable with that, you can turn off your video. Um, you can also change your name. So it's just a first name, a uh, letter, an initial. Uh, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, we have disabled the chat this evening, but if you have questions, you are welcome to chat with Arpi or myself as the host and co-host. We ask that you not chat with our presenter so he can stay focused on his presentation. Um, his presentation will be about a half an hour uh, or so, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. You may use the raise hand feature, or if you're not comfortable asking your question, you can type out a question to ask to Arpi or I to speak on your behalf. Uh, we're thankful that you're with us this evening and uh, looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Arpi. Thank you, Jenny. Uzenk shonagal chun haidner ser polorin, vor ais meg jama dramatreci kev niatsak mezi ais garevor nyutin shurch. Ihar gevor polores tejvar uzaner baher gabrink hairenikhen ners, Arsahi Yev Spirki Mech, Haiz Sharunag, Mer Havatka, Huisa, Yev Sera, Vargamana, Mer Mech, Ashkarhi, Chorskormera. Thank you for joining us this evening for Vemkar's special live session, God is with us. Vemkar, as most of you know, is the Eastern Diocese's digital ministry for the diocesan vision, building up the body of Christ. We've included we will include the links in the chat, so you are welcome to virtually visit and follow us. Vemkar includes topical and relevant modules. This summer, we launched a pilot multimedia module called Christ as Healer. We chose the topic of healing since it's part of our daily lives. We seek for physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing. The essence of healing is found in our Bible, in our liturgy, in Christian life, Christ taught, preached, and healed. Going through a pandemic, we sure turned to God for healing. Little did we know that we as a nation, we as the church, we as advocates of truth, were going to seek healing as we live through the 20th century genocidal stories and nightmares of our great grandparents in the 21st century. Little did we know that we were going to pray for the healing of our soldiers, the mothers who lost their sons, the wives who lost their husbands, the newborns who are going to grow up without their fathers, civilians who were killed, and the ones who were leaving their homes, the land they carefully tended, the centuries-old churches they maintained and prayed in. Little did we know that before our recovery, from generational trauma, we would yet again seek healing for the wounds from the same sword today with way more powerful weapons. But little did they know that their actions in the early 20th century resulted in a strong, faithful Armenian Christian diaspora. We did everything and will continue to do everything in our power to help our people during this time. St. Paul's words come to mind. If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? Not everyone is able to hold a gun on the front line, but as part of the body, each one of us, based on our various and unique talents, our skills, our capabilities, we did and will continue to assist, support, and even provide healing one way or another. Deacon Ryan Yezras Teladian, one of my dear and close friends, a fellow graduate of St. Nerses and St. Vladimir's seminaries, not only took his camera to Artsakh, but also his training, 
skill set, and faith as a deacon of the Armenian church. Deacon Yezras was born and raised in Central California and is currently teaching as, his, as he finishes his doctoral degree in psychology from the new school. At this point, I'd like to invite Deacon Yezras so that we can see Artsakh at war through his lens, hope in his words, and healing in his actions. Deacon. Thank you, Harpy. Um, I don't know about you, but it was hard for me not to just fall apart during that introduction. Um, it's good to see many of you that I know um, and love, and I invite you on this journey with me, um, as Harpy said, through the lens of my camera to bear witness to the things that I saw, um, experienced, felt perhaps, and um, become a little bit more personally attached to the war and to the people in particular. So first off, um, I don't know how many people here have a personal connection with the war. How many people here knew somebody who was fighting on the front lines um, some people may, might not even know somebody who knew somebody who was on the front lines. Um, some of us knew people who died on the front lines. And for me, the personal connection during the second into third week of the war uh, was Deacon Kevor Kajian. And it's in his memory that I would like to offer this evening's talk. Uh, Deacon Kevork would come every Holy Week to St. Illuminators in Manhattan and sing with us with his beautiful, you know, share his beautiful gift with us. Um, he was also a staunch patriot, a nationalist, and had been living in Armenia, even though he was from Anjar. He'd been living in Armenia for um, well over a decade and was a well-known opera singer. Um, but he was my personal connection. It was, I think, after we found out that he died on the front lines that um, really that seed, that, that impetus for me to go really, really blossomed. So I think I may have gotten the wrong, pardon me. Let's see, my apologies. I wanna make sure I get the one with English here. All right, so I'm just going to take you through day by day, um, sort of a diary fashion, um, the week or so that I spent in um, Artsakh and the additional week or so that I spent in Armenia. So we arrived on the 21st and, um, or I'm sorry, on the 20th, I ended up on a plane with Michael Krikorian from the New York, from, uh, from Los Angeles, uh, we were both working for CivilNet and we're planning for our trip the next day to get to Artsakh and met this lovely group of teenagers on the street. And they um, started to explain their story to us because, you know, he and I clearly stood out, um, you know, me with my big camera and him with his notepad. We were clearly there. Um, not as locals. And so we struck up a conversation. One thing led to another. We went into a coffee shop and uh, sat upstairs in this big room and somebody else was sitting there and they were interviewed and started singing for us. And this woman afterward ended up offering to record them. And you'll see, uh, you'll see that on Armenian Vibes, um, the recording of this lovely group. And 
this group of kids, they came from Stepan Aigert, most of them, and in effort in an effort to help those back home in Artsakh, even though they were in Yerevan, they were using their music in order to raise money for the people on the front lines. Um, we were very moved by their stories. Um, they were refugees and they're all trying to help and just want to give you a little sample of their music. This is, this is raw, um, like the rest of this, um, the rest of this presentation. Um, it's going to be pretty raw, but here you get a sense of who they are um, and the joy that underlies their very being. Even <laughs> So you can kind of get a sense for um, the kind of souls that these people have. And for the rest of the presentation, I hope that you see through these images and through a little bit of narration or whatever I've written, um, you'll see God come through. You'll see love come through. You'll see compassion come through. You'll see community, empathy come through. Um, even in the midst of war, and perhaps especially in the midst of war. Um, it's very interesting for us then to visit a soldier in the hospital who was wounded on the front lines. And this was our first, you know, firsthand introduction to what we were in for going to Artsakh. Uh, what Smerch missiles will do to a person's legs. Um, what suicide drones sound like. Um, Edvard, this, this gentleman and soldier, uh, explained to us these things, shared his story, which I'm not going to repeat now and um, find it very difficult to repeat anyway. Um, but there's also a sort of romance story that, you know, could be written for a screenplay. I'm not going to go into that either, but um, this his nurse and he um, had spoken and, and hung out a little bit before the war and then um, he went off to serve and she didn't hear from him until uh, he had been wounded. It, it had been a month since she heard from him and he just sends her a text message while he's in the ambulance transport on the way back from Artsakh to Armenia. That's how bad it was. And he was saying, hey, are you free to talk? <laughs> Do you have a minute? And this guy had such a sense of humor. You can just see it on his face. Um, and those of you who are scandalized that he's smoking in his hospital room, there was no oxygen, I looked. Um, no hookups in the walls either. And when the doctor came in at least, he put the cigarette out and then as soon as the doctor left, lit another one. But um, this, is, this is our dear Edvard. You see the joy even amongst the suffering. And so we go to Artsakh. You've probably seen pictures of this sign. And at this point I'm thinking, man, I don't, I don't feel very different. You know, I know we're crossing a border, but you know, it doesn't feel like a war zone. <laughs> at least it didn't yet. Um, for those of you who can't read Armenian, it just says that independent, or free Artsakh welcomes you. One might argue that's no longer the case, at least not the way it used to be. 
So we landed in Shushi that night, spent the night in a hotel in darkness, lights out because we didn't want to be targeted. Um, we were right by Razan Jetsots, um, right across the street, in fact. And so when I woke up the next morning, this was the view from our hotel. I got to see her in all her glory, even damaged. And this is, this is a symbol of our faith. Perhaps this is even more a symbol of our faith than the completed or renovated cathedral. And you'll see why in a little bit as well, I hope. And our faith and for this man, his service as a soldier were not separable. Um, Dervaraz Dat is an amazing, strong man and um, just a beast. <laughs> he he's, stands a half a foot taller than I am and I'm six feet. And um, he said that, you know, he and his brother clergy would go to the front lines and they'd go to baptize soldiers. And in fact, he was going after this. This time we spent together, I translated for Michael, this particular interview. And afterward, he goes to the front lines to baptize soldiers before they go into battle. And I saw him a couple of days later and asked how it went. And he said, you know, it was a miracle we made it back. Um, and it was very clear that a lot of the people that he had just baptized probably didn't make it out that day. This is his work. This is the work of a clergyman. This is our faith. I don't know who among you wouldn't think of Revontians, of the saints of Leon going into battle with Vartan. Um, he wears fatigues under his cassock all the time, ready to go. Most of the people, if not all of them who made it out, would use the word harashk. They'd use the word miracle. It was a miracle we made it out. Um, I'll have my own miracle story, don't worry. <laughs> Barkev Surpazan, who some of you may know or some of you may not know, I'll just tell you, um, likely suffered. The news reports his doctor, or, or I'm sorry, another priest saying that he likely suffered a heart attack during these times. Um, it was minor enough that he was able to make it through the war um, without hospitalization. But you can see in his eyes that he's, he hasn't given up. <laughs> Look at his eyes. He has not given up. This is a man who still has joy in him, who still has hope in him, who's playing with Michael in this interview. He's playing with them. This is a hero. There's so many heroes. And everywhere you turned, there was a story. This was one of the things I went for. One of the things I went for was to spend time with people in a shelter and experience it with them. And I'll tell you, there was a lifetime packed into this week. And there was a decade packed into the couple of hours or so. I don't even know how long we spent there. there. We didn't keep track of time. And we weren't the type of press, the type of journalists to just come in, get our story, take some photographs and leave. I saw that, it was awful. Um, this family fed us from this very pot of Tanabur. I got a couple glasses, it was delicious. They're offering us, us hospitality, us outsiders coming in for a story. Of course, what else could we expect? This was one of the guys on our team, Gevork, who bonded with this kid immediately. Um, they warmed up because of people like this um, Gev is originally from Armenia, from Yerevan, but he served his compulsory military service in Artsakh. Uh, was our operator, our videographer. Um, 
also shoots film photography as well but one of the kindest gentlest souls you'll ever meet um and you say his name and every time he responds ha john it's always yes dear yes dear Um, Michael, who is on the team with Lika Zakarian, who writes for Civil Net. Maybe some of you have read her things, and if not, I highly recommend reading her diary. Um, there'll be plenty more about her as we go through this. Um, another remarkable human being, and these girls, these girls were something else. They were they were toying with Michael at first. They were sort of like, "Who are you?" Like, what do, you, what do you want with us? And kind of flirty, but also standoffish. And they warmed up. After a while, he piqued their interest. I think we piqued their interest. This one, this look I call, I, 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 I think of this image and I want to know what she knows that we don't. I want to know what she knows that we don't. Why that smile? Well, on both of them. Why those bright eyes? These girls who were telling us they know the difference between regular artillery and a smirch. They know what, uh, what drones sound like. This is in the room adjacent to where we were. This was a larger room where they, there were other beds and here there were, I'd say 10 people in this particular shelter between these two rooms. And just sitting and watching the TV, watching the news, knowing that there is a geopolitical, they're telling me this, there's a geopolitical game being played on top of them and they want no part of it. By the way, I got some of this cheese and some of the bread and one of the guys, you'll see him in other pictures too. He, he wanted to, uh, he, he gave me a drink and then he wanted to give me another drink and I saw the dirty look I, he got from his wife and I'm like, no, no, I still have to work, but thank you, you know, but he would have kept serving them. And, um, you know, this is, these are, these are the people that we were with. And Linka with the family together. You can see that they're not, I mean, they they knew each other from Stefan Aguirre prior to the war. And these are some of the last children that remained in Stefan Aguirre. These were the last children that Lika knew of that were in Stefan Aguirre when we were there. And again, watching, watching the news, watching this game being played while they hunker down in the shelter with the siren going on and off and on and off and on and off and never knowing when you needed to run downstairs, never really feeling safe going outside. This guy was the one that wanted to get me drunk. <laughs> and you see, you see she gets it. You see she gets it. And amidst all of the pain, amidst all of the fear, you have this joy. You have this joy. You have the hospitality. You have love. You have community. War may be a result of the worst that humans have to offer, but it has a way of bringing out some of the best in people too. This is one of them. I think people kind of go to their extremes and the good only get better in difficult times. This is Lika, we, we were on our way back to the shelter she was staying in and her brother was back from the front line for a couple of days and uh, she was expecting to see him there at some point later in the day and on our way back from the shelter she we run into him on the street and just the pure joy on their faces to see each other the pure love this 
This is down in our shelter, just so you get a sort of visual of what we were dealing with. This is downstairs um, in our hotel and the sandbags, of course, to prevent, um, you know, anything from flying in and the windows. Clearly somebody knew what they were doing when they taped up these windows. Um, so this is a little smoking spot and people would just go out and hang out. And we spent a lot of time downstairs in this, in this communal area together as uh, there were a lot of journalists in the, in the hotel. This is one of the main rooms we were in. I spent my first night there because the siren went off. There's a whole story there I don't necessarily need to go into now, maybe if there's time later, but I went downstairs with the first siren and hung out there for an hour, hour and a half with everybody else. And then people trickled up and then as you would guess, five, 10 minutes, the siren goes off again. So grab our stuff, go back downstairs. I took my sleeping bag and pad that time. I came prepared and uh, spent the night down here. And there was this lovely little kitty that joined me. And I think I've got some pictures of her later, but um, she's a whole story in and of herself. A um, couple little segues. This one is about the new words that I learned or the phrases that I heard commonly around um, during the war. You know, I, I went to seminary where I learned most of my Armenian, um, at least to start off and um, learned how to do sermons and that, these kinds of things. I wasn't prepared for wartime terminology, you know, apostat on like, I'm, you can use that theologically and maybe um, Dr. Irvin will get upset at me for not knowing um, a slew of references that I can just exegetically pop out. But anyway, apostat on was one that, you know, I had to learn. Azdanashan, which is the word for alarm. That's not, that's not generally a word you hear used theologically. <laughs> Um, maybe in certain circles, but on Port Sank, this was without tribulation is the way I translate it. You're, you know, without trials, you know, um, uneventful, essentially. And this was what would be wished to soldiers and people in a time of war. This was not something I'd ever heard thrown around as, as frequently, if at all, in a time of peace wishing people to be in, in a peaceful situation without trial. And also to the military, we would wish good service. Um, that may include a good death. It may not include a good death, but regardless, you're wishing this person what it is that they would, with a goal of theirs to serve well. And then this question here is one of ours, Meronken. Um, you can imagine hearing artillery, you know, and, and it's so close, right? So um, it's, it's, you have to get trained, your ear has to get trained to understand whether the artillery is coming from you or coming toward you. It makes different sounds, kind of a Doppler effect, how many booms you hear, this kind of thing. It, it's very difficult to explain if you haven't experienced it. Just like, what does the alarm sound like? You know, I, I'll forever hear that in my ears, along with everybody else who was there, um, as well as everybody else who was there in the 90s. Um, but is it one of ours became a very common question when we'd be sitting outside in the patio, on the patio at the hotel. And, and yeah, oh yeah, it's one of ours. Um, or no, 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 it's not one of ours. There would be a little discussion sometimes and got to the point where, you know, I was like, all right, this is, this is just getting comical. So the guys are outside, you know, military vets and stuff, and they're, they're arguing over whether it was one of ours or not. And, you know, Armenians are still sexist. So a woman comes out, um, she's an amazing uh, cineast herself, a documentary filmographer. Angela, uh, she comes out and she's asking, is it one of ours? And I'm, I'm, I'm shooting the guys this look like, you better tell her it's one of ours so you don't scare her. So it became this sort of a joke, like, is it one of ours? Oh yeah, yeah, of course it's one of ours. You know, there's nothing to worry about because if it's one of ours, it's coming away from us, you don't have anything to worry about. Um, this was the climate. 
this was the climate. Um, we ate together, we laughed together, we, we just, we supported each other and there was levity even amongst this. So here is, uh, I was blessed to be able to be in the wedding at Chushi, um, not just as a photojournalist, but this was one of those times where um, my diaconate status came in handy. I told the priest, hey, you know, I don't see a deacon around and I'm a deacon. So if you need some help with any of the litanies, you know, just give me a nod. I got it. I said, okay, okay. So I'm looking around. I'm like, okay, where's the wine? And so I help fill the wine and you can see the dust on the wine um, from the attacks on the cathedral. And wine itself for us is particularly symbolic in that we take something that God has created, grapes, all we gotta do is water them, tend to them, and we get grapes. And we take those grapes and we create something out of them that is not creatable naturally without human interference, without this co-creation, without humans getting involved with God's work. There is no wine, at least not like this, <laughs> not drinkable like this. Yeah, you might have fermentation, but there's no wine like this. So you think of the idea of taking stuff that just existed. Maybe the church too. These rocks that were just there. Space that was just there. And create something around it. Create a different space. We did that with the church. We do that with the wine. We do that with our lives. They're not ours. We didn't make them but we co-create them with God. And this lovely couple, I, I, don't, I don't know I, what happened to him. I hope he made it through, but um, they had a very important night ahead of them as he was only off for a couple of days. Um, he got a couple of days off from his commanding officer and um, was going to go back to the front um, the next day. So they had set the date of the wedding before the war broke out, just a few days before the war broke out. And since it's bad luck to change the date of one's wedding, they decided to stick with it, um, even despite the war. And luckily, um, the soldier's commanding officer was gracious enough to give him a couple of days off. And so he went from seeing his buddies being killed and pledging even on the battlefield to replenish them, to have children, to replace them. He comes to his wedding and he knows he's gonna go right back. You can see the symbols of the wedding, the cross for the Chachich fire crowns and the glass of wine and then in the back you can see just the remnants of the cleanup effort from the attack on this cathedral i started singing <laughs> um i saw your i think is this point and um couldn't help it. Couldn't help it. At first, there was some there was some TV reporter in front of me, an Armenian TV reporter that got a little frustrated. She's she just like frustrated with me for you know interrupting the broadcast and messing up their audio or something like this. And she realized, no, I I was actually singing with the priest and I knew what I was singing. And so she gave a nod to the camera guy and turned around with her microphone and i was like i don't need this like no they're they're the important ones and they like they said this foreign journalist was singing along with the service and um you can see here all the press there's no congregation there are no people it's mostly us you can imagine we 
the 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 importance of this event was is not to be underestimated there's a reason why there were this many press here and why there were so few people by the way uh remember they fled a war you can see the smile on the bride's face, Zubido Farsa. I mean, this is this is priceless stuff here. This is, I mean, you want to look at the face of faith and hope. Here's one. And punctuated by periods where you can see serious it's serious this is another one of my favorites in terms of its symbolism because you just add to what i was saying about kazan jetsots at the beginning and you add to that the fact that in the middle of the war here they are getting married and there's a smile on their face on the both of their faces you'll see toward the end i'll, I'll have a close-up of that and that evening i was blessed to serve it was a saturday in a giragamadits service the uh, vespers on saturday night into sunday which has resurrectional overtones to it and we sing Louis Savart, um, and um, this was probably one of the highlights for me, just to be able to serve with Barkev Sarbazan. And I want you to notice, I want you to look at the altar. You're looking at the altar here, on the chair, with candles, on boxes, in the shelter, in the shelter, I should say near the church, with about 30 people living down there in the same room that you're looking at. There's, there's a little bed tucked under the stairs over here. There are another couple of cots over here. Um, this was their life. This was their life in this room all together with Barkev Sarbazan, with his priests, with his deacons, they were all together. So you see that picture of Barkev Sarbazan. I had to explain this to somebody. He has his head down on the chair. And I was asked by a, a priest in California, you know, is, it, is, is he as bad as he looks? And I'm like, you know, I, I don't know. His spirits are high. I don't know how he is physically, but his spirits are high. And that picture, I think, is just because he's tired. The, guy, the guy's got to put his head down sometime. He's in this room all the time. That picture is in this room because he was there all of the time. If he, weren't, if he wasn't in his office, he was in here with the people, praying with them, encouraging them. You know, there is a part of me that was wondering, you know, why make such a big deal about me being a deacon and going? And I told RP, you know, after a while it started to click, you know, something that um, Levon Altipar Makian coined was always be scanning. Deacon Levon would say, always be scanning as a deacon, ABS. As a deacon, you never can just check out of the service and be overwhelmed and uplifted in prayer. No, you, had a, you have a job to do. You're the MC. You got to keep things going liturgically. So you got to always be scanning and looking for something that needs to be done. What does the priest need? Anticipating needs and meeting those needs. And it's a constant, it's, it's a constant awareness that gets um, ingrained in the deacon. Um, so that training, and I'll, I'll tell younger generations of deacons this too, that training isn't just for church. 
that training can be applied outside of church as well to be able to be attuned to the needs of others and respond to them that's the work of a deacon and though you know we pray these litanies for the peace in the whole world you know for the peace of the whole world and the stability of the holy church and it you know i'm down there in the shelter and i'm thinking you know it's one thing to be praying this from yetem or manhattan or northeast or midwest or the south or wherever you are in peacetime it's another thing to be praying this because you're in the shelter you're not in you're not upstairs in the church you're in the shelter doing a truncated liturgy because you you don't know when there'll be an attack it's a whole other story and that night at the end of the service of this vesper service as in every night there's a litany that any good deacon knows by heart and i want to bring this to your attention because most of us don't hear this unless they're steeped in some monastic tradition or semi-monastic tradition or seminary or something like this we normally don't come across this um Adivakal, i think it's used or it actually stayed in the Adivakal service books um but pay attention to this remember lord your servants our parents teachers brothers friends companions pilgrims so far so good nothing really stands out right travelers the dead laborers confessors penitents captives sick okay those who are suffering leaders all sounds fine and then malefactors chararares those who would do evil to us mentioned here i might add before benefactors before asparadares and then you have our enemies those who hate us we're praying for our enemies and those who hate us when at any moment we might die because artillery might hit the church artillery might hit us while we are praying these prayers do you understand this is faith this is what jesus meant when he said pray for your enemies love your enemies pray for those who persecute you this is what he meant so there's this syrian couple stefan agert that re repatriated you could say they were refugees from syria during their civil war and um he's he's planted he's he's not going to leave he's probably still there i hope to see him again there soon um he has this restaurant samra and anybody who comes to his door anybody at all doesn't matter whether you're military you're local you're a foreigner you're press you get fed as much as you want you get as much of the soup as you want um gerusus basically eat it and shut up <laughs> don't ask what's in it just shut up and eat it and his wife cooks and he serves with his son and they're back and forth together von hovig is there though all the time and um this is what you do he's really a beautiful soul i can't i can't impress upon you the gratitude i have for the goodness i saw in people i didn't expect that i expected to see a lot of other things during a war i did not i did not expect to come across such good caring loving beautiful human beings this is his garden <laughs> he says uh he matter to nere chen yer ker fights uh, that there are no birds singing here now oh yes only bombs that's right only bombs but in the spring the birds will return 
This is his faith. This is faith. This is hope. And this is love. What else do you want out of a gospel that's being lived? Overhead trellis of grapes. He knows, he knows, he knows Stepan Aguirre could be done any day. Look at him. Where else would he rather be? And what a lesson. <laughs> Isn't that for our lives? Even when there aren't bombs going off around us, missiles and drones overhead. Why would we want to be anywhere else? How, like to, to have that kind of experience in a time of war. And then back in the hotel, this is our view again out of the lower deck. You can see a huge cross in the distance and that'll still be around. That's still under Armenian territory. That's looking toward the south. Again with the bags. This is our view. This is our view. All right. Then you've got Lika, um, who is one of the kindest, purest, most loving, good people you'll ever meet. Um, again, just a blessing to know this person and her dad to meet him and understand that they're there's a reason why, um, there's a reason to still hope. There's a reason to hope in humanity and the goodness, in the goodness of, of humans and what we can do and what we can be, um, even when our home is being attacked. Um, you can read about Lika on CivilNet. Um, she writes a daily diary. If you haven't seen that, I would highly suggest it and follow her experiences. She's back in Stepan Aguirre now. Um, I was just in contact with her today and doesn't know where she'll be. Um, trying to decide whether or not to convince her family to get out of there or they're gonna plant themselves there or what's gonna happen. But um, amidst all of this uncertainty, you, you see the kind of people they are. I don't have to tell you. So we also went out to a village in the Matuni region to interview a doctor that had come out from LA. His wife says, you know, you've got a wife and kids here. And he's like, yeah, but I, I, you know, I've got a family there. I have a family I need to take care of and they need me more right now. So he comes out um, and serves in the way that he could as a, as a physician. Um, in the emergency department. I mean, the whole hospital was essentially an emergency department. And it took him a while for him to be convinced to come out. And um, again, that schmoozing with our, with our team helped a lot. And he gave us some time and explained his story and where he was on the 27th of September. And there's this, this brief moment that he and Michael had, Michael's um, basically giving him kudos. He's commending him for doing what he did. And you can see, you can see the humility on his face, I would say. He's just doing what he can. And he knows it's not, it's not enough because there's still a war. He's going to keep doing it. And he kept doing it. And afterward, we were on our way to Martoni and stopped for a, for a photo op with Monte, who happens to be from the same city that I'm, I'm in right now, from Visalia, California. And uh, so Michael knew Monte back in the day and whatever, wanted a picture. We're, we're out in this field. You can, see, you can see the village in the distance, right? You can see the village out behind him, behind the sign. And um, 
uh, just to give, give you, let you, okay, so when I was there in 2005 and stayed in Martelny, during a time of peace, it's so close to the line of contact, we heard, we heard skirmishes, we heard, we heard gunfight. Um, and then, but we're so close now, and I know we're close. I know, I know Azeris are like right on this ridge. I know, I know. I just, I have this, this awful feeling about this being a once in a lifetime opportunity and maybe being a last in a, in a lifetime opportunity. So not after, not 10 seconds after this was taken, you know, and, and, and by the way too, I don't know if you know this, but the Zeris would, you know, capture these villages, so to speak, and, you know, raise their Zeri flag. And it was a big deal to have a picture with the name of the city or the village, whatever. Um, to show that it was still yours. So I'm thinking, I, I just have this feeling like we're being watched. Like they, they, they know we're here. We're in the middle of this field. Like they, they know we're here. Marduni was, it was contested during the war. So not 10 seconds after this, about a hundred meters away, uh, artillery falls. We were just a group of journalists. We had press on our, so it didn't matter. You feel the impact under your feet before you hear it. So I instinctively dropped to the ground. And then something happened. I focused. You're there. And in that moment, you know that, well, if it were a smirch, I would have been gone. If I didn't hear it, I would be gone already. Nothing's bleeding. I'm alive. And how can I go up against this artillery? So really, it's a life and death moment. And there's nothing I can do about it. One of my friends, a military vet, a Marine, I called him to consult him after the F-16s got flown to Baku and that whole thing. I'm like, what do I need to worry about? Anyway, and then this happens and I, I call him, I'm like, you know, something strange happened and I just was able to focus. He's like, yeah, man, some people do yoga for years, you know, and they talk about radical acceptance, you know, and, and magnanimity with all of their thoughts and this kind of stuff and non-judgmental attitudes to their emotions. And he's like, all you need to do is go to a war zone because there's nothing you can do. You're faced with death and there's nothing you can do. So you just gotta accept it. You gotta accept that you're still there and that every breath, every breath is a gift. Then on our way back to Stepan Egert, we pass a village that has been attacked and this this is this is one of I think this is a cool shot because you get to see the cows in the foreground, right? You see them? You see them in there? They're just hanging out in the pasture while their village is burning behind them. There are some people that prefer humans to or animals to humans rather. <laughs> Wonder why. So on the way back. Um, on a hill just above us about 50 meters or so because the car was going we couldn't hear the telltale signs that there were drones above us you know the sound of two motorcycle engines is the best way to describe it um, thank you Edvard the, the injured soldier from the beginning but uh, we didn't hear the drones because of the car but all we heard was Boo, 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 boo. And you got these drones that these suicide drones that'll just hover and drop at an opportune moment. They saw us coming as journalists and they're like, oh, we're gonna get you guys, or at least scare you. No military targets. And so again, we stop, focus, and shoot, because that's what we're there for. Gev is with his video camera. I've got mine taking still shots, and then we just continue home. And, you know, as, as 
another person who I met there, Chuck Holton, uh, said it's just, it's not really a fair war. It's a cowardly war. And this is one reason why. And they would kill us just for being there. They would kill us just for being there. Um, I want to share just a brief story and I'm, I'm wrapping up soon. But I met this mother, she was at the hotel that we were staying at. And she's sitting on this couch as I'm coming down the stairs. And I see her and I'm like, something is up. I met a mom whose eyes stared into infinite emptiness. And I ask if something is up. She answers the worst. I had three sons. They're all together now. And as soon as she said, I had three sons, I knew where she was going. And now they are all together. And so what do I do? <laughs> what do I say? What, what, what would you say or do in that situation? Just put yourself there in the middle of a war in this, this woman who cleans your room like a mom would just lost her third son. All I could do is draw on my CPE training and just shut up and be with her. At a certain point in life, that's all we can do for each other. And maybe we would do better if, that, if we did that more often. I'm not sure. But there, what am I going to say? I'm just going to sit with her and put my arm around her and be with her. So we leave Artsakh on the 28th. We leave Stepana Garrett. We get past Shushi. And then Michael goes, we have to go back to Stepana Garrett to go get the his passport that he left at the hotel. It was just like, of all times, in the middle of a war. And that same day, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Does anybody recognize this, maybe? I know it's from a distance. But this rounded building. It's all intact now, but later that same day, this is the maternity hospital that was hit. This is a view from the back of where we were staying. I don't know why I took this shot. I have no other shots from that morning before we left. I have no idea. I found this, I, I realized it after I got back to the States that I had a picture of the maternity hospital just before it got bombed. So we went back to go get Michael's passport and we're leaving Stepan again. We start to hear the shelling behind us. We get up past Shushi and we're like, okay, we can take a breath now. But we couldn't even park on the side of the church in Shushi because it was too dangerous. And I thought, oh, you know, maybe they're being a little paranoid. And then I'm thinking, no, probably not. And then after we're definitely, no, not paranoid. So this is RP, who is a refugee. Um, now in Gordis, and she gave an account of the night of morning of the 27th, um, what she was doing and, and her prayers, her prayers for peace. Um, she turned to reading scripture during the, the attack that first day. And Mike, Mike pressed her. He's like, what were you reading? What were you reading? And she said, you know, and what was, what was bringing you comfort? And she, she cited um, the passage that we read in the Hoke Honki service more, most frequently, that unless a grain of wheat dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And she's, at this point, worried about her brother and her cousin. And of course, everybody knows somebody on the front lines. You know? This is, this is faith to me. This is, this is another face of faith. And I thought this was a little bit humorous. Caution, beware of falling pears. I mean, we're in Gori's at this like resort hotel and there's this sign because, you know, in peacetime falling pears, you gotta be concerned about falling pears. Um, 
Not so much so here. <laughs> just like, <laughs> I'm worried about other things falling on me at this point. And they're still making wine. There was this kid who was, you know, half drunk at 1 p.m., walking around and picking grapes from the overhead trellises and bringing them to the ladies. And um, they're picking, uh, you know, picking off the grapes and starting to make wine. And they were asked, um, so this is our driver getting in on the action. He starts to flirt with them a little bit. Our shog, he was, a, he was a hoot and a half. So Michael's asking him, so what's the first toast that you're going to make? And they said, to peace. So whenever this wine is ready, the first toast they're going to make, they said, will be to peace as the artillery falls, as the rocket falls from our backyard. And again, going back to co-creation, we have something from God and we have a responsibility to do something with it that is creative and not destructive. That is, at least for me, a core part of the gospel. And uh, this little this little gem right here was picked up. I didn't know this at the time, but it was picked up by somebody else, another another journalist at the hotel in Stepanakert. And uh, or they were the this cat was out at um, a cemetery. So this other journalist brings her back. Um, and I, she ends up spending the night with me that first night in the shelter when I was on the floor um, downstairs with my sleeping bag. I see this little thing come in and, you know, pop up on the chair and under the table. It's a nice safe spot and you got a nice little view. And if you're a cat, you understand these things. It's ideal and it's in the corner and there's no draft and there are a few people and you can see who's coming and go. It's perfect. She and I thought alike. So she ended up deciding to join me that night and really brought me comfort. Um, I took her back with me to Yerevan and was gonna bring her back to the States. It was gonna take too long. So I found her a nice home in Yerevan. Um, I couldn't imagine her being left behind and Azeri's getting to her. I just, I named her Gyank. I named her life. So if you know the Ravi's culture, it's a little joke, but um, she was life. She was representative of new life from the war. So I just want to give my gratitude, express my gratitude to CivilNet for helping me with credentials and giving me an, an amazing assignment, an assignment of a lifetime with Michael Krikorian. Um, Artsakh Band, you can look them up. That's the group that I showed earlier. Samra Restaurant, which is still standing as far as I know it and with Holvig. Uh, Mike, who is the journalist. Lika, um, the journalist for CivilNet. Gevork, our photographer, he took the photograph of me in the church. Um, and Arshak, who is our driver. And you can visit our yesras, our E-Z-R-A-S dot com, if you'd like to see my photographs again. Um, all the ones you saw, I believe, are up there now and uh, with captions too. So please share that if you'd like. Um, you know, I think it's really important to see the human side to what was going on. Um, and I hope that you were able to enter into that experience uh, with me personally as well. Um, and finally, here are some links. Um, and uh, to the social media for Vemcar. You can visit the website, Facebook, the app, or Instagram.